Hi there. Uh, welcome to this uh, final session where we will be talking about uh, building carbon stocks in the uh, environment. We've got a few more people sitting down, so feel free to sit. Um, and what we'll do is we will um, uh, get each of the speakers to introduce themselves uh, and uh, introduce their sort of topic. Um, and then what we want to do is really challenge you to ask us some questions. Well, I have got some up my sleeve, but actually this is your event and it's very much about you sort of asking questions and using the expertise that we've got here uh, today. You'll also see as the speakers introduce themselves that they're not as listed. Unfortunately, we've been struck down by uh, COVID uh, and some of our speakers have been unavailable. So you will see some changes. I, I'm John Foote. I'm head of environment at AHDB. Uh, and I lead a team uh, that very much support uh, farmers across the UK to sort of move towards net zero. Uh, we're looking at developing tools and services to do that uh, and to provide uh, advice. Um, but, you know, I think agriculture right across the UK is going through some of the most fundamental changes that we've seen in uh, several generations. And I think the rate of change that farmers are going to see is just going to accelerate. So it's going to be interesting to see what our speakers think about this. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to the, uh, our first speaker to my right-hand side uh, and get him to introduce himself. Hello, I'm, a, oh, sorry. I'm a Charlie Owen of, uh, with the Woodland Trust, um, an outreach advisor covering the east of Scotland and the central belt. I am one of the aforementioned late uh, introductions. <laughs> uh, short notice, so... Please bear with if I can't answer any of your questions today. I'm happy to take contact details and get back to you at a later date, um, uh, if that's the case. Um, yeah, I'm just sort of the, the question I want to get across uh, or to find out opinions on is what are the barriers um, to integrating trees and woodlands into modern agricultural systems, obviously with a carbon point of view on it as well. Thank you for that, Charlie. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name's Kenneth Lode. Uh I'm a soil physicist actually, and I'm another late um, replacement, uh, so not a carbon specialist, but obviously I'm aware of the role of carbon within soils. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear uh, the comments from people, uh, just to deliver, give a bit of background with a Scotland uh, focus. So there was a project that was commissioned by Climate Exchange in 2018 uh, that looked at soil carbon across Scotland. And they looked back through the data and saw that since 1978, soil carbon has not really changed since then. So over a 40-year period, soil carbon hadn't really changed. Um, we know that by changing from a cropping system into a grassland system, you increase soil carbon. And likewise, from a grassland system, potentially a forestry system, uh, you increase uh, soil carbon. So one question is, is, is it really feasible to increase carbon in arable soils? Okay, that's a bit of a um, antagonistical question, I suppose. Um, and the other thing is, okay, uh, what do you actually want to increase soil carbon for? Do you actually want to increase soil carbon to improve the function of a soil? So, for example, how much water that soil will hold, how much water can go through the soil, or do you actually want to do it uh, in achieving net zero to offset some of your other um, issues? So that's one particular question with soil carbon. And the other thing is understanding where your soil sits with its capacity to hold carbon. Uh, so this goes back to stuff that John's been talking about with the um, national, um, my mind's gone blank at this point, uh, but yeah, effectively looking at the baselining uh, of soils in Scotland. Uh, so I kind of will explain it and excuse the fact that this has got rubbish in, uh, but say this bottle is your soil, okay? And when you fill it up 100% with carbon, this bottle is full. But do you actually know where your soil is relative to the amount of carbon it can hold? We know, yeah, that a heavy clay soil will hold more carbon than a sandy loam. But actually, yeah, do you know if you have the capacity in the first place to be increasing uh, soil carbon? So it will be interesting to hear your thoughts on that um, as well. Again, slightly not really incendiary, but more of a, a topic for discussion as we go through the conversation. Thanks, Ken. You've pretty much nailed all of that. So <laughs> carbon hasn't changed in 40 years. So yeah, where do we go now? Um, so I'm Chris Leslie. I'm part of Cloud Farming, uh, which is a management consultancy business and farming business in Scotland. Um, we started looking at carbon about three, four years ago now um, with an American company. And it became clear that they were looking at a five-year project based on the soil. 
Um, so first things first, we went with the Hutchie guys and we took the soil carbon readings from the ground that we are, and that's still our policy to date. For the last two years, uh, we've sold carbon based on the crop in the ground, um, which is the 11 month cycle. So we've gone down the instant route because we're very much in contract farming or management. So it's an instant. What you've done in that 11 months, you take that carbon certificate for and you get the cash for it move on type thing. So that has started once we get into the algorithm, we're starting to realize things and systems and sort of adapt to encompass carbon with what we're doing in farming and management. Uh, we're moving towards no-till, we're changing the rotation to spring cropping, we're putting more cover crops in, which is all good stuff anyway, but that is also being backed up by the carbon credits on an annual basis. And after the five years, which are not there yet, we'll go back round on our soil test and see if we have actually moved carbon anywhere and see if we can get payment for that as well as the instant every year. Just to respond to Chris's comment there. Um, so Chris explained there a change in the way he's farming direct drill and things like that. So obviously over that 40 year period, the management of the farm has changed. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's true that, okay, soil carbon isn't increasing. But when you look at the time frame that you need to be monitoring soil carbon to see those changes. It is possible that soil carbon has increased, but we just haven't seen it because we haven't let these new approaches to managing the soil become fully established yet. So again, that's a caveat, and it is very much slopey shoulders, uh, and it doesn't say, okay, you can't or you can, uh, but more that, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it's complicated, it's just complex, and there's multiple factors that can influence uh, the ability to increase soil carbon and store soil carbon. So uh, hopefully that gives an introduction. I'm going to just kickstart the questions, and then I think we'll, we'll come out to our uh, audience. So we, we've been talking about increasing soil carbon, but you know what are the benefits of doing that? Because you know is that something we should be doing? You know it sounds a good thing to do, but what does it do apart from maybe some carbon credits? Uh, and you know why should we all be thinking about you know building soil carbon up, or or is it just a, a false premise? I'll just answer that from a soil physics perspective. Uh, so soil carbon obviously is linked to the function of a soil. Uh, so we'll say that carbon is an indicator of the function of a soil. And then what we mean about a function is the structure within the soil. So um, yeah, that's carbon's role on that. So by increasing carbon, therefore, you have greater porosity. Uh, so that means the soil can drain more, free, drain more freely uh, when you have intense rainfall periods. Um, but also it actually has the ability to hold more water when you have periods of drought. So that's, that's the benefit of increasing soil carbon in relation to the function of a soil. But it doesn't mean that it explicitly measures function um, either. Thank you. Um, so I think from our side of it, I suppose I've had the first 20 years of my career where we've really kicked the can clean into the air out of fungicides and you know, intensive arable farming. And I think the last 20 years, if I make it that far, of my career, I want to have some fun and things are different and just see where we can get to with it. So there's no definitive that I want to save the world and sequester carbon. It's just a different way of farming. And I think the fun part of it is to see, as a group of people that are looking at it, how far we can get with this. And none of us, you know, what we're into this now, probably 10 years into it, not adverse to change. You know, I don't mind change. We don't mind failure. We don't want it but we start to look at things differently. And that's gone back to soil sampling. Um, we're working closely with the Hutchie guys. We're looking at soil results very much differently um, to start things off. And then we're looking at the crops that go into the ground and what we do with the crops and just trying to quantify that in what we do. Carbon, I think, comes as a byproduct to it. It's great to have the cash, it does help. Um, you know, we're not at the profitable conventional commercial aspect of farming. So when you are doing things differently, it's a managed yield, good words from Gavin earlier, but we are trying to manage yield as best we can on a risk-based approach, if that makes sense. And carbon, hopefully we're doing good, but we'll tell you in a couple of years time on our five-year project. I haven't got a whole lot more to add actually, um, just beyond probably my limited knowledge on <laughs> soils, but in increasing or improving the carbon content of soil just to increase the productivity uh, and the health of woodlands and forests and all the additional environmental biodiversity benefits that come with it. So. 
Thank you. So it sounds as if it's a good way of, you know, building up resilience and health of your, your, your farm. So maybe it's time to ask the audience some questions. So uh, we've got a hand up over in the uh, sort of right-hand corner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ken, question for you. Um, have you, can you quantify if we increase our soil carbon by half a percent or one percent, how much more water we, in theory, should be able to hold as a result? It's a very good question, David. Um, I did, uh, I can't remember what, it was mentioned to me a while ago about the potential capacity of increased uh, storage capacity, but it's not something explicitly that I've looked at. So obviously there have been links to soil carbon and function, which includes water holding capacity um, structure. But it isn't, the other thing to be aware is it's not explicit. So for example, if you have your carbon in the soil, um, it can be linked into the generation of soil structures, which then therefore stores the carbon more tightly, so you're less likely to actually um, lose it, as w uh, keep it, shall we say, as well. So it's not explicit like all of these things um, and there are general benefits but I couldn't give you a figure off the top of my head at the moment but it will increase we'll, we'll say it will increase plant available water so plant available water is that point from the maximum ability of the soil to hold water to the point where the plant can no longer physically extract water from the soil so it will increase it but I can't give you a figure for it That information does exist, and actually, I think it was Eric that mentioned um, that, Eric Anderson from Scottish Agronomy, who mentioned a particular figure to me, and I think it's, I think there was something related to an extra six days of water available to the plant, um, based on an X amount of improve, increase in soil carbon, but something like that, but it is quantifiable. Do you know the answer to the question? No. I just <laughs> it, it might be used because carbon seems to grab the headlines just now because we're just we talk about trading carbon and making money out of it you know that's what Chris was talking about really but from a more basic point of view what agronomic yes there's structure benefits and there's water holding capacity benefits etc but if we can quantify that into you know for every one percent you get another week's worth of growth out of your crop then that builds yield and we can we can attach a a more simple value to it that we can you know we can strive for something and know the gain as it were yeah no it, it I, I agree and it is something I'll I promise I'll get back to you on that I will find out more of what I can um, yeah dig a little bit deeper into that uh, and come back with an actual answer rather than a slopey shoulders um, non-committal to anything in particular thank you thank you we've got uh, a, a question at the front as well Hello, I'd like to ask, is there an optimum carbon level? Can you have too much? <laughs> I'm so glad I offered to stand in. Um, not really, as long as it's, it um, depends how you're increasing your carbon. Okay, so say for example, you were putting compost on your soil, okay, and we'll say that there was an you were unlimited the amount of compost you could apply to your land, then there would be potential for leaching that would be detrimental. So it's kind of like an incidental impact. Um, there isn't really, in my mind, that I can think of a reason why there should be an upper limit for soil carbon if you're not having a potential leaching effect um, on how you're putting the carbon in there. But I will say, and like I said at the beginning, there is a maximum ability for the soil to hold carbon so whether you can't keep adding carbon to the soil and it won't keep going up, so there will reach a limit. And when you go beyond that limit, I suppose the reality is there is potential for that carbon to be leaving the system some other way. Um, so nothing I can think of in my head why you couldn't, but the reality is you wouldn't be able to anyway, unless you did it in a bad way to have yet yeah, secondary um, emissions. 
probably more going to be speaking to you as we usually do with this but on that point it's quite interesting one of the things that we've realized over the time is there's applied carbon and there's growing carbon and the two are very much not the same from what i've figured out that if you apply dead material, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hold it or get it, versus growing carbon and roots and living soil is a different world to applying it. And I think, you know, as farmers, we always think we have to apply our way out of things. And this time, that's just not going to happen. And I think we're far too much and um, being put against us with MVZs, PVZs, uh, you know, everything being sampled and checked against, that actually we almost need to grow our way out of this instead of looking at applying our way out of this. But I'm not quite sure how the two differentiate. It's an interesting question. It's almost like the difference between sequestering carbon and storing carbon, which is a very different thing. So storing carbon is where you have it locked up within your aggregates in the soil. It's stable. You're not going to lose it very easily, whereas sequestering is the whole process of getting carbon into the soil in the first place. Um, but it's a very different process to storing it. Um, similar to peatland, so increasing storage of carbon in peatlands, a lot of it is about wetting the peatland, which therefore makes it stable, and therefore you therefore reduce the losses through erosion or emissions and the things like that. Uh, so it's really a, a sequestering and storing um, issue when you're looking uh, at the next level of carbon, um, increasing carbon within arable systems. Thank you. So I, I'd just like to sort of widen out the, the sort of remit and just think about, you know, how can we stack or uh, bundle benefits together? So, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, building uh, soil carbon and the benefits it might bring in terms of water retention, in, in terms of nutrient holding. But there are ways in which we could potentially build carbon stocks in that arable landscape. And I use the word landscape uh, in that sense. You know, so what other benefits should we be looking to accrue? And, you know, what's the best way of doing this? Uh, yeah, I agree. That's a good, it's a good question, is how do you sort of quantify um, the benefit of getting soil um, locked up? I know there's the, the Woodland Carbon Code, uh, so financial gains that way. But it's uh, looking, um, again, at all the additional long-term, longer term that we perhaps don't know of probably don't know yet exactly um, trying to put a some sort of figure on that whether that's financial or something else or output um, that's a great question and I, I I have not got the answer I'm afraid but no, you no. <laughs> so uh, recapping on that so you where do you get to John so you know how can we I suppose how can we stack or bundle benefits you know so biodiversity net gain, it could be building carbon in that landscape. You know, how should you be rewarded for doing that? Oof. Yeah, that is uh, a, a really a tough one. And I suppose, you know, from the farming system, I, I don't know whether you look at it simplistically or, you know, you look down the agroforestry route um, to see where there is mileage in that. I mean, most things have been done before. So it's a case of really, how is your business set up for it? You know, you've got, you have to be careful in this that you know, the business structure that you're in and the land ownership, whether it's contract farm, rented, tenant, and whatever it is, has a, has a major effect on what you're able to do and who actually owns the rights to what it is you're improving. So without opening a complete can of worms, you know, we should probably go back to the soil, I think. So, um, so the two components of that, so bundling and benefiting, mm -hmm. okay, they're the two key words I got from that. So bundling things together, so one example of that might be the things like cover crops, okay? So you're putting them on the land. Uh, you're, you're minimizing losses of carbon through erosion over the winter. Uh, you're inputting carbon into the soil through potentially deep rooting things. Uh, so potential to be getting carbon deeper into the soil uh, to stabilize it as well. Um, now the benefits, um, I, I could have got it wrong, but I suppose when I see benefits, I instantly think money, okay, what should you get? But actually, you have to look at the multiple benefits in function rather than just a monetary term. And I suppose there probably is some figures about, uh, David asked a question about, okay, how much more um, water would be available to the plant um, with X increase in carbon. Um, and the same would be true of the function of the soil. So actually by improving the function of the soil, 
how much money are you saving in not having to irrigate? How much money are you saving by, um, especially if you had a nitrogen fixing um, species in your mixture as well? How much are you saving on fertilizer? So actually, the benefit is on multiple levels and not necessarily about re being rewarded financially um, for that particular change that you're making to your system. Thank you. And that makes it quite a hard sell, really. I, you know, as a farmer, I'd want to, you know, maybe see the return on investment a bit sooner rather than, you know, something that may be sort of a little less tangible. We've got some hands up here. Um, thanks very much. Um, going back, two questions ago, I'm just going to answer something that David asked there about uh, how much more water holding capacity would you have? Uh, that's very much going to depend on the actual form of carbon you have, whether it's actually active, um, if it's added carbon that Chris talked about, or if it's actually um, uh, probably the humic type, and that's going to be either full of a humic or, uh, or human uh, version of that. And the figures that you hear banded around is, ar is around about 160,000 litres of water per hectare uh, per year actually retained for every 1% increase in uh, organic matter. I would have said that's probably for every 1%, uh, not organic matter, but of actual humic content uh, of there. Um, then jumping forward, uh, two sections to the, the question that's just been uh, asked. I would have said that it's probably quite important to remember that it's actually a carbon cycle. It's not actually a target that you achieve, attain, because you're actually requiring it to be a cycle because you need the soil to actually leach carbon quite readily because it's one of the two basic components that all plants are needing. So everything we've talked about in every single stand today is just a story about carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, water in a plant, the sunlight as a catalyst, through photosynthesis, creating sugars. Some of that going down through uh, roots to feed microbes, which in return will give the nutrients if they're there and balance back to the soil. Um, so it, uh, when we talk about being bacterial, as you mentioned, somebody said there with fixing things, bacteria are relatively small um, proteins. If you can get your plant photosynthesizing to producing much greater complex states of, uh, of carbohydrate, such as fats and waxes and oils, etc., they're much longer chains and they take a lot longer to break down. And so you actually end up slowing down the carbon cycle for a greater net gain. And if you'd always remember that it is at any point during the cycle is the net gain that you've actually managed to retain in the soil um, without giving too much away, rather than actually just being a set. I've reached this, yay, job done. Thank you. Probably just add on to, to Dave as well. And one of the bits you know that does become clear that jumps into your head when Dave's talking about water retention and the other David uh, is talking about nutrition. And actually, when you put the two together and you get three, four, five years into your no-till regime, actually what you find is that your soil mineral nitrogen retention for crop establishment becomes vastly improved. And that's a bit that we're all trying to get to very quickly, which is why we need to really quantify the type of carbon that we're putting back into the ground, whether it's living or dead, and what is the benefit of it. But definitely, the bit if, if, when we start to retain nutrition and water, we can get crop establishments so much better, and that's very, very difficult when you reduce tillage. Thanks. Anna Sellers from SAC Consulting. It's a question mainly for Chris, but uh, free for others to shed some light on it too. It's really around, um, I'd like to understand a bit more about the decision-making process uh, behind the, the American scheme that you're involved in. Was it was the driver really about exploring a new income stream, or was it more about the uh, was it a nice sort of um, uh, byproduct of, of exploring other kind of measures on farm? What was the kind of driver towards that? Well, I, I mean, we were involved with quite a few different clients, and um, quite a few. Well, none of them are agricultural based, but you know, it was put to us, you know, probably four or five years ago that carbon is going to be or was going to be the next big thing, and we should be looking towards it. Um, and when our business sort of started up back in 2018, we were looking at it and which way to go, and we could have went commercial or we could have tried something different, and we decided to try something different. And then when we start the research and looking around, we'd been listening to podcasts and we'd come across um, the company in America, 
and you know when we got on the calls with them we very much discovered you know there was a five-year process and you had to go really 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 hard to actually get the benefit out of that after five years and the changes that were being discussed and needed um, and the influencers in that were fairly drastic so as a decision we thought right we can't commit to that wholly because we're on a lot of different agreements but we thought we should have a look at that on the side uh, and then look at something else that was a bit more based on the crop that was in the ground um, which we've done with Agrina for the last couple of years um, and that's just a pretty quick and dirty way of doing carbon uh, just based on what's applied to the crop or what's not applied to the crop um, and the benefit that you get on it um, but we are keeping the five-year goal if you like to see if we are managing things properly but I can see already becoming clear to us is that we're going to have to get out of wheat because it just doesn't work um, you know we cannot build enough fertility into the soil with wheat in there and the management and the whole business set up to grow wheat and take ton, 10 tonne per hectare off is just fast so we've realized that pretty quick that actually we will be a more legume based and spring cropping rotation on most of our farms Thank you. Any other hands? So, uh, hi there, William Salter. I'm a crop physiologist at the University of Sydney. Um, Travelled far to be here. <laughs> um, a lot of my work does indeed focus on in, uh, just capturing more carbon, um, which with our work, the focus has been that carbon will end up in the grain and we'll get greater grain yields. Where do you see the potential to just have improved varieties that sequester more carbon into the soil through the same, the, the same sort of processes? So I, I might start answering that one for you. So, you know, HDB manages the sort of recommended list and at the moment that sort of process really doesn't limit you know uh nitrogen you know it's it's put on in excess so it's not a limiting factor uh and and so i think what we need to do is think about how we evolve that so we almost end up with an environmental recommended list or a, a sort of real world one where you know the nitrogen is more limited because of cost or other environmental issues and then see how those uh you know uh cultivars perform under those, you know, real-world sort of scenarios. And uh, you can still do the, the sort of unlimited sort of nitrogen sort of type experiment, but I think it, it's, it's having that more realistic sort of scenario that I think is valuable. And then there's the slow process of, you know, selecting the right ones for, you know, maybe regional uh, variations for, you know, different sort of, uh, um, uh, sort of yields, et cetera, to, to get to a, a sort of good place. We can also, you know, uh, use gene editing. And the, the uh, sort of uh, government in London have uh, started a consultation on gene editing, and I think it has got a place to help accelerate the development of those, uh, you know, varieties and cultivars that are really going to help, you know, deliver those environmental uh, benefits uh, and do so in a way that ensures that we can continue to grow, you know, key crops in a way that is cost-effective uh, and provides food security. And I think that's really important now that we've got the Ukrainian crisis. So, you know, it, that's one of the things I think we lose sight of uh, quite often within uh, parts of the, the policy sphere. Anybody else? Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I have high hopes for gene editing because I think we've just gone too far on the plant breeding, you know, sit on the RL committee as well. And I, I see that and it's pretty difficult to see how we're getting out of this without gene editing and there's loads of things that can come into that you know it's been done for a long time before as well so it's nothing new we just need to accept the fact that that's we've gone too far where we are and we need a pretty quick fix to get out of it um on the ground uh, we've been working with dodds of haddington we've gone back to crusoe um which was back i've always been known for harping on about shamrock but i love it the color of it and the disease resistance we've done a lot with dave on that um we are moving all towards group one milling wheats um, because if we're going to be doing this thing where we're building fertility there has to be a benefit to that so for me i want to influence food and its characteristics so i'm going back to saying well I'm, there's no point in doing this and growing feed wheat let's go back and see if we can do it with milling wheat 
I'm milling varieties. I don't want to produce alcohol, so I want milling oats, and I want bread making quality to come from our business. Otherwise, you know, we'd be as well going back to commercial agriculture. So to me, that's where we're aiming to go. So we've gone back a few stages in terms of varieties and where we want to go to. Not really done too much on the carbon measuring of it, but it looks fantastic. So that's where we are with it. Thank you. We had another hand up here. Uh, Paul Hargreaves, SIUC. Uh, just trying to pull a couple of the threads together and uh, hopefully uh, you're willing to look a bit into the future. But uh, from the impression I'm getting from what you're saying is within the arable sector to uh, sequester or store this carb. And then there's going to be a lot of different factors coming into play, cover crops, potentially not growing wheat, if that's what you find from uh, what you, uh, you've been doing with the work over the five years. Even if you put everything together there, are you looking to what David said earlier on about a mixed system with animals now uh, to increase the organic matter and the carbon within the soils? Or are you, you know, how radical do you have to be to start achieving some of these targets? Because they're there, they've been set, and at the moment, even from what people are saying, we're not, we're still quite a distance away from there. So, what would the future of arable farming be? I think probably David should have a bit go at that as well, because the, the livestock side of it is what you bring to it, isn't it? I was, I was saying, you said uh, you're moving towards a mixed system and you can see that's the way of increasing uh, carbon within your soils. Um, is that the way forward for arable farming to move into a more mixed system? Moving to livestock, naturally the inclination is to put more grass lays in and if you put grass lays in you're instantly uh, boosting your carbon um, but also livestock for us are a really good short-term thing for Chris's point about the fertility we can grow a cover crop through the winter recycle that recycle that through ruminants late winter early spring and get um, get that that nutrition cycling back into the following crop quite quickly we're not 100% sure how much of it we get back, but um, that then allows us to to reduce our fertilizer requirements to the following crop to a certain extent. And then, of course, if you go to the carbon trading side of thing, like I said this morning, 40% of our carbon emissions at Balburnie are fertilizer. So we can find ways to reduce it. And, and you'll get some meat out of it too. So it's productive and useful on all scores, I think. So, yeah, I think it's really important. But if you don't like animals... It's a bit harder, but there's plenty, there's plenty of people about there that can help you with that. Uh, John Thompson from DC Thompson's. We, do, we invest in ag tech companies. Chris, um, can you talk me through the commercials of how you're monetizing your carbon credits? Um, are you insuring your crop? At what point do you monetize the carbon credits? Do you forward sell? How do you... How do you do all that? Um, so we'll get, John can touch a little bit on the uh, commodity side of it. I mean, ev you know, the world revolves around the stock market as far as I see it. You know, we're in business, so stock market is crucial. I think the dangerous part is when you put social aspects against a stock market trade, which has to be uh, taken, you know, very, very carefully. When we're doing it, so with Agrina, it's based on a 11-month cycle uh, whereby you put your crop records into the system. It's an algorithm based against that crop as to how you treated it, what you did, what you applied. Uh, and lo and behold, the less you applied, the better off you get. So you then get the certificates per hectare for that crop per field. Um, they ultimately, they've reduced it now. We do have potatoes in the rotation, but it's a five-year scheme. So you've got a one, five, and ten. Um, and you can choose what you want to go into. We are sticking with one year because we're quite short term. Um, but you get the certificates at the end, which can be anywhere from half a certificate up to about four. If you're in vine and peas or after a legume, you generally get more uh, certificates for that. So there's a benefit which legume crops obviously have a fair cost penalty to them for growing. 
Um, so that's a huge benefit to it. And then from your certificates, you are then free to take your certificates to the stock market. Um, the guys are in their second round of funding for that. They're on to their 20 million for that. So currently they are paying out of that pot for the carbon credits. But the aim is to get them onto the stock market where we'll be able to trade openly these certificates at your choice, at your risk. But they are coded, they're my certificates, so I decide when I trade them. Um, and that's as far as I know, but John has a bit more. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, and I would say, you know, the approach that uh, is being taken there is, is fine because, you, you know, you're doing it in, in the year or over a five-year period. And in effect, you're sort of selling backwards what you've, you've already delivered and you're not sort of selling forwards. I think where you're selling forwards your carbon, maybe you're investing in trees and, you know, the Woodland Code is, is uh, you know, the better of the schemes. Um, you need to take professional advice when you're going down those sort of routes uh, because you might be selling the carbon too cheap. You need to understand who owns that carbon. And, you know, we, we dodged the, the sort of bullet in terms of that, that particular can of worms. But really that needs to be sorted out before you go into these agreements. Is, is it you or if you're a tenant farmer, is it your landlord who can take that carbon off you at the end of the day? Uh, and all of these things have got to be thought through before you sort of sign up to these things. So I think where you're, you're sort of delivering, you know, based on practices and it's, you know, that you get the money at the end of the year or, you know, each year and then there's a final balloon payment with, you know, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the, the, the money withheld, I think they're generally sort of okay. Then the question is, when do you sell it? And, you know, again, if you're sort of contract farming, you're, you're, going to, you're going to see that very much more as a sort of cash flow or an addition to that cash flow, and it, it helps the bottom line. If you're a, you've got a mixed sort of farm, you might actually want to hang on to that carbon because the price of it may be a bit low at the moment, uh, and in years to come, you know, your customer base might say, right, we want you to be net zero. If you've sold that carbon, you can't go out and sort of recreate it you're then in the facing a situation where you're going to have to buy the, the carbon from the market, and I can guarantee it to be at a much higher price than you probably sold it for. So I think, you know, whatever you do, you need to think through carefully, have a, a strategy, understand what those risks are, and take that professional advice. Otherwise, you may find that you've caused a few more problems for yourself in the future. May, maybe it's worth just talking about how the Woodland Code works and, you know, how that maybe differentiates itself from some of these sort of soil carbon practice based sort of schemes and how that maybe provides an income scheme for areas on the farm which you know maybe aren't great for arable at the moment but you know maybe great for trees or biodiversity enhancement do you want to say something? uh yeah absolutely um i mean so i don't know too much about the carbon other than the woodland one and even with the wooden one it is it's a real it's a, it's a minefield we do have our own set carbon guru uh, unfortunately that's not me but um it does provide a good way um, of, of generating that income um, in the process, if that makes sense. So you don't, uh, there are ways you, you don't have to wait until further down the line to claim it. You can get some coming through at the moment, whether that's as an annual payment um, to sort of offset any, any losses, financial losses, or you get percentages at different increments. Um, but then the advantage of using not, not just us, but someone like the Woodland Trust as well as, you know, we manage all of that for you. Um, sort of reduce, reduce the time spent on that and time is money, of course, as well. And, and I think that's important, you know, the Woodland Trust, you know, the, car, the Woodland Carbon Code, the Peatland Code, you know, they're recognised by the government as being sort of robust schemes and they attract a higher price. So if the price is too low, it's either somebody in the middle is making a lot of money off your back or actually it probably reflects the, the uncertainties of the scheme and therefore, you know, you're getting a lower price in terms of carbon. So I've come across, you know, examples where, you know, farmers have sold their carbon at 10 to 15 pounds a tonne. The mandatory carbon market, you know, for the emission trading scheme is around 70, 80 pounds a tonne. So there's a vast difference and that's really down to sort of the quality and the quantification of that carbon being stored in the system and the longevity of it. So where there's greater uncertainty, the price then drops. So, you know, the better we can do in terms of measuring carbon, uh, demonstrating we're building stocks and its permanence, and also something called additionality, is it being put in there 
because of what you're doing new rather than what you would have done anyhow, then you know you can get a better price for it, uh, and and you know that that's part of the the, the the uncertainty around the market at the moment. It's early days. I, you know, I, I described it to somebody this afternoon as being in the foothills. So there's a long way to go, I think. Uh, but you know, if there's a long way to go, there's a significant opportunity for everybody if uh, it's managed correctly. Yeah. Do you not think there's a bit of a risk here, regardless of the credibility, is, is actually taking the farmer's perspective. If you're going to trade this, you're not getting full value. You're actually taking a counterparty risk because actually the title, you have to be very careful as to the title of that carbon credit because for working capital purposes, the company that you're doing this with, they're strapped for cash, whether you like it or not. Like the company you've just mentioned in the States is doing a fundraising because it's absolutely against the wall given the way, that the, way the working capital works. It, it's really, really precarious if your carbon credits are in some way still, someone else has still got a lien over them and you've monetized even a portion of them. I don't disagree. And, and in fact, I think you should look at carbon credits at the moment as almost a bonus. So, you know, if it delivers, and it's, it doesn't come with a significant counterparty risk to it, uh, but maybe it doesn't materialize, well, you know, you've not lost much. If it does materialize, then it's a bonus, you know, and, and see it that way. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the point has been raised to us, and we've been watching and watching and watching, and, you know, you'll be aware of once they get past this round how they actually get to float, and they need a certain amount of carbon to be viable to the stock market to be picked up. And I suppose... You've got to take the view, do you want to get them there to be part of it, or do you not? Um, and, you know, if they're offering 70 euros per hectare, 80 euros per hectare, you know, would you not take it, do you? It's a one year that you've signed up for, so to me, the certificates have a date and an end date on them, um, and it depends who you're selling them to, you know, because there'll be a lot of middlemen in them, as there is in the grain trade. But the way I look at it is, you know, we're three steps from the stock market. Whereas when we trade the grain, you know, as most of us have seen in the last couple of years, by God, that can be pretty tricky getting your money out of people, can't it? And there's no insurable way against that. And does it matter whose grain it was? You still didn't get your money. So, you know, what are you comparing to versus risk? I mean, you know, as farmers, we're probably the biggest gamblers on earth. You know, you're 12 months ahead. Who's bought their fertilizer? You know, most people have. Who sold their grain? You'd be mad if you didn't. You know, but we're going down the way now. So risk rewards? I think the carbon seems fairly stable compared to the volatility of where we're at of nitrogen versus carbon. Uh, and nitrogen, you know, Gordon Rennie was explaining to us, which I hadn't picked up on, you know, our comparisons in the strategic farm has been with ammonium nitrate. That plant shut. We're not going to have ammonium nitrate. So now the comparator's urea. Now you start using urea, you get a whole different set of results out there. You know, you really, really do. So actually, carbons are stable there. If you can get 60, 70 euros per hectare per year, you're going to need it. You know, when we start going to urea and uh, the inhibitors that's in that, I mean, that's, that's just a different world. Thank you. That's a good point. You know, there's so much moving. It's a complex, complex thing to be a farmer. So we'll take one last question. And we've got uh, one over well, there. Uh, hopefully it's a good one. Um, Anthony Pink from Agri AgriCarbon. Um, I think, shameless plug, just first of all, uh, represent a company that does carbon sampling. But I think uh, what you're saying about the, the uncertainty and the stock market and everything else, um, the question is carbon capture, is it for the carbon credit that you might get in the future at a certain value? Or is it for improving the, the quality of the farming and everything else? And it could be seen as a benefit and a bonus. Uh, but the, I guess the point I would like to make is if you don't measure accurately enough as early as you can, you're not going to make the full amount of that benefit when you finally get to the point where it truly is a tra tradable commodity. That is a very good point. So uh, how, 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 how can we actually sort of measure that carbon accurately? We've got, you know, uh, services such as that. You know, have you had problems measuring the, the sort of carbon on your, your farm? Is it quite variable? Is it easy to do? We probably should have the map up. So we've um, went with Hutchinson's. Uh, so there's a chap in the corner that's probably better uh, qualified to tell us about it. Um, do you want to? I mean, I don't know. How, is it, how does it look? Is it? 
Yeah, I, can't. I thought my talking was finished for the day, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah, we've been measuring it for, you know, as a commercial service for one year now. Um, obviously, there's other, other people in the market as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's a valid point um, made that it's quite, you know, it's a, it's a lab analysis like you would analyze for pH or phosphate. So, yeah, it's relatively simple to do. I think there is still question marks over... Um, whether, you know, what will be a standard carbon uh, value that will be allowed or accepted by the companies that might start trading in the future. I guess that's the only question mark there is at the moment, but certainly measuring it is, is very simple, just taking a soil analysis. And, you know, you can do that to a very detailed degree like Chris, Chris has with herself, so you can do it in a very simplistic one sample of fields, um, you know, like you can do with any other analysis, really. So I think the important thing is coming back to probably some of the earlier discussions was, you know, making sure that that complies with whatever standard is going forward. And I don't think we've got to that point yet, ultimately. Sorry, Lewis, just to ask you a quick question. Do you measure bulk density when you're measuring soil carbon? We use an assumed bulk density based on texture, organic matter. So, yeah. Okay. So the reason I mention that is that it's fair enough measuring LOI or loss on the ignition or something else like that, but without actually knowing what the bulk density is of the soil, you have no way of knowing what your carbon stocks are. And that's the other thing that we really need to be aware of is what our carbon stocks are. So you need bulk density really to get an accurate measure of that. So another shameless plug. Um, <laughs> so when you say that, yes, and that's part of what we do is we measure the bulk density at each sample point across the entire field. So we get the full variability of carbon so that you can see a really good picture of what the carbon looks like, depth, density, everything. Right, thank you. So we've had, a, I think, quite a good debate. I've got to try and summarize that. Um, I've got to say my head hurts at the moment. But I think, first of all, it seems to be important to measure your, your, your carbon in the soil, including the bulk density. So you know what you're starting with. You build that baseline. Then you can look at, you know, some approaches that build that carbon stock uh, and the benefits. Well, they could be very different depending on the system and where you're starting from. But overall, it seems to be a good thing to do. It gives you greater resilience against drought, holds nutrients uh, and potentially sort of reduces the cost. So, you know, uh, and then, you know, if you've got excess carbon, well, there's the potential to trade it. But, you know, tread carefully, take some advice. Uh, but again, depending on how you go about doing that, it could be a win-win situation to give you that bonus and a bit more you know, business resilience. So at the moment, I can't see too many negative sides to building up your carbon stocks and building up carbon in a variety of ways in that arable system. So anybody who wishes to disagree with me, I shall be behind the screen in a minute. Uh, and, and we can see you outside with uh, handbags. I'd like to thank uh, Charlie, Chris uh, and Ken for stepping up and in some cases at very short notice to... Uh, stand in uh, and uh, I'd like you to show your appreciation for our uh, speakers in the usual way.